seeing them on TV from this old house and then the new Yankee workshop. But what I appreciate what the gentlemen are doing on this old house is they are putting action to their words and saying, hey, look, we recognize that there is a gap of skilled laborers. We recognize that we need to train our next uh, generation. And so with that, they are here promoting the next gen. And I would like to thank those at Festool who made this happen to get them here on stage with us today. So Rick Bush and team, thank you very much. But if you here in the crowd would please help me welcome to the stage, Mr. Norm Abram and Nathan Gilbert. Good afternoon. Hope you've been all having a good time at the uh, convention here, seeing all those wonderful tools that we work with. Um, what I want to do is really start out talking a little bit about why I'm here, how I got here. And basically, that's what's driven my uh, passion to kind of make sure that we save uh, the skilled trades. So I'm going to tell you how I got started in it and when I sort of saw the light of what I wanted to do with the rest of my career in my life. So I was uh, I'm the son of a carpenter. And in fact, uh, I always looked at my dad as being a, um, um, you know, a mentor because that's what he did from day one. I was always by his side when I was a kid, um, helping him do things. And he was more than a carpenter. He could weld. He could work on machinery. Um, he was one of those people who was just brilliant working with the tools. Now, my first toolbox, um, I got when I was about six, seven years old. It had real tools, a real saw, a real chisel, a real tape, a real hammer. You can't really do that these days, but back then you could. And I used to build things for my sister. I had a younger sister, and I would just take scrap lumber and just bang it together. It was the most ugly looking stuff you would ever imagine to see. But it made her happy, and it was, it was something that I had fun doing. Now, the first time I was ever on a job site, I was nine years old. My father took me to a job site, a company he was working for. It was the night bef couple nights before Christmas, and uh, we were going to do hardwood flooring. So here I am, at this age, getting told how you put down oak flooring. And this is not with a pneumatic nailer. This is with cut nails where you learn to drive it in the tongue and you use the nail to set it in place. And my father had taken an old milk crate, this is before portable saws, and mounted a circular saw under it so it was like a little uh, table saw. And you can tell he was always trying to figure out how things would be better. My father also had a little shop in his basement of the house I grew up in, and often he would come home with materials for building a vanity, for, for instance, and uh, he had the table saw and a joiner and, and, uh, in this little shop area, and I used to just fool around a lot down there, not with the tools in the beginning, but I would watch him, just learning by watching him, and then eventually he would let me do a little bit, sanding maybe, and a little bit more, maybe you get to push a piece of wood through the saw, Maybe you'd learn how to use the router to do um, edges on, on pieces. So, oh good, my thing doesn't like to stay open all the time. Sorry about that. Um, so fast forward a few years, and I'm working all my school vacations and summer, uh, during summer, doing, first doing renovations, then building houses from the ground up with my father. He never had a construction company, but he always worked with a really good company. Most of the time, they were renovations early on, but they were custom homes. And that's when I really started to learn things. Um, it was like, you learn how to put down the sills. You learn how to frame the floor, and it up and up and up as you learn to the house. Back in those days, um, if you were a carpenter, you didn't do just framing. You did framing, roofing, putting in windows, siding. It wasn't as broken up as it is today. Um, <clears throat> And that's really when I got hooked on the challenges as well as the satisfaction of creating a house, building a house, and being able to say, I worked on that house with my father and the other craftsmen who were there to build this beautiful structure. I was going to college at the same time. My father wanted me to go to college. And um, as soon as I got into this love of building, 
I uh, changed my major from mechanical engineering to the business school. And I wanted to learn a little bit about how I might be able to run a, co a company someday and have a company of my own. So I, I didn't get a degree. This was back in the 60s, 1967, 1971. And I, in, in uh, 1976, uh, I'm sorry, when, in, um, I'm sorry, I missed out one thing here. Uh, so right after college, I joined up with a startup company in Boston, three um, people from MIT and one guy from uh, Harvard. And they had come together with these ways to build buildings in some uh, semi-prefab uh, way on the job site. I went from a carpenter to a project manager, and from a project manager um, to being asked to be manager of project managers, and I didn't want to do that. So I left, and in 1976, I started my own company, uh, basically renovating and building houses. Back then, no problems getting carpenters, plumbers, electricians, plenty of them out there, very well trained, ready to go, and it was, it was great. Then in 1979, this old house was born. And I won't tell you the whole story how I got there, but I got there, obviously. And this year, we're celebrating 40 years of, uh, of having that show on the air. And again, never had problems, electricians, plumbers, and so forth. 40 years later, here on the anniversary of uh, this old house, we have a big problem. You know, we have all these empty jobs in the construction industry. and. It's, it goes the whole, amb uh, the whole areas of all things, kitchens, finish work, carpentry, plumbers, electricians, and there's a lot of new technology out there that you have to learn, um, especially with systems in new houses. So across the board, there's plenty of jobs, not enough people to fill. How did this happen? How did we get here? Well, we could talk about that for hours. My, pr my pitch on this right now is that what we want to do is we have to mentor the craftsmen of the future. Um, if we can, you know, we can't talk about why this all happened. We just got to find new ways to do it. And all of you who are in the businesses and already trained really have to be part of that transition as we go along. And my, I think if you can get one out of every 10 young people who might be interested in working in the construction industry, to start to learn a trade, and they have to be taught very clearly that this is a lifetime experience. It changes every day. Um, there's new things coming up. But the rewards are, are there. You know, the money is there now. Uh, the security is there now. And you know, you may have a downturn in the construction industry, but everything goes down when it goes down. It goes up and down. I've survived through a couple sessions of where the economy got really bad. And I, I went through the trouble of making sure I paid my guys whether or not we had work because I needed to keep them. And we have to train these people and we have to give them the opportunity to, to move along. It's hard to be a contractor and, tra and train people at the same time, but it's something that I think we have to do. Um, you know, so what we decided to do at this old house a couple years ago uh, is come up with a way that we might be able to help solve this problem. So we launched this Generation Next initiative. And um, I was asked to go out to Colorado to meet Mike Rowe um, because we didn't have a foundation. And he has a foundation by which we could uh, have scholarships go out to potential people to learn a skilled trade. And he was very generous about it. He was a lot of fun to work with. Um, and so we moved and started doing that. That was in August of that year, two years ago. And then in three months later, when um, we were at the International Builders Show, the folks from our um, this old house staff who do fundraising and go out and get materials and were asking for contributions to the scholarship fund that we would, uh, that Mike would control, but we would help raise money for them. We gave him a check for $500,000. So since that time, some of that's been distributed. Uh, we're continuing to do that into the future. Um, and we probably support um, Mike, Mike Rowe uh, Works. <clears throat> His foundation is, is good, but it's still going to take more than that. 
Um, I think we then decided that how do we get involved with this? So we started the idea of having apprentices on this old house. And it wasn't just about having a carpenter or that being the only one we went to. So we sort of set it up so that all of the building trades that work on this old house now have had apprentices every season. And I think that's the best way to go because as an adult, you know, if, you've had, if you have children, you know that if you're an adult and you tell them something to do that, or that they shouldn't do, they don't want to listen to you. But when you see someone who's in the same age category telling them the same thing you told them, they might, they might just a belief, they might just say, oh yeah, okay, I'll do that. So we started looking around. We had a setup on the website where we would start having people write their, uh, write their qualifications for becoming an apprentice on the Salt House. I remember reading the first uh, group of them. They were very interesting. We've had a couple in the last couple of years that were really, really interesting. And fortunately, some of them have actually gone through the process of being an apprentice with this old house and done exactly what we were hoping they would do, which was to move into uh, learning a trade from the sources that they need. Um, and that's, that's been really a great thing to see. Now today we have with us uh, Nathan, who was in the first, one of the first apprentices to um, be on this old house. And, uh, he, he had some good times there, and I'm going to let him talk a little bit about how coming onto this old house and advance the career that he was already on a path and, uh, and, and how he feels. Because I, I, I would often say someone like Nathan can probably influence a young person to get into the trade almost better than I could because there's, a, there's something there, you know, it's that adult, you know, adolescent thing sometimes doesn't work. But when you're on the same level, sometimes it works a lot better. So I'm going to let Nathan do a little bit of talking, and then we will take some questions and answers. Thank you for having me today. Thanks, Norm. So as Norm said, I was uh, in the first class of apprentices for this whole house, and uh, it was quite the experience. Never did I think I'd be able to work on a show that I always grew up watching and admiring. To uh, highlight my short story, I started off, I was born into it. My father was a general contractor in the South Shore area. He, uh, he did it all, start to finish, much like Norm's father, as he was growing up. He kind of taught me to be hands-on with everything, and if you could do it yourself, then do your best. Uh, after high school, I joined the military, I joined the CBs, and I kind of honed my craft in framing, masonry, construction. I got the chance to travel the world, went to 14 countries over five years, and had a lot, we did a lot of humanitarian aid, and people always say, what was our favorite place you traveled to? And I'd probably say, uh, this little country, Timor last day, down near uh, Indonesia, off the coast of Australia. And they love Americans there, so we had a lot of fun working with them. After I got out, I was uh, working with my father for a few years. I decided to start my own carpentry business, and uh, along alongside working with him, so we kind of go back and forth, job to job. And then this opportunity came up to be an apprentice. Jumped on that and got to work for 10 weeks with some of the trades best. After the uh, show wrapped up, I didn't think I'd have much of an opportunity to work with them again. You know, it's 10 weeks and then I go back and continue working with my father. But I got a call from the producers and they said, hey, would you be interested in doing a couple of house calls with Ask This Old House? And I was excited. I said, yeah. And they started asking me, can you do this? Yeah. Can you do this? Yeah. And they said, can you do that? I was like, I don't think I can do that very well. But yeah, I can do that too. I don't want to miss any opportunities. So over the last few years, uh, last year mostly, I've got to travel with Ask This Old House and have a lot of fun. Um, but a lot of my drive is built off of working with my father and the relationship that we have. And I can remember being really young, and one thing that's always motivated me was it was a hot summer day in New England, humid, 100 degrees, and we were roofing. And I had heard that some roofers would take the afternoon off. They'd work in the morning, come back at night. And I was talking to my dad, and I said, hey, is it ever too hot to roof? And then he's sitting there, he's sweating like crazy, and he wipes his forehead. He goes, is it ever too hot to make money? I said, no, I don't think it is. He said, all right, get back to work. So I've, I've always tried to take that motivation with me through life, that uh, you know, you get in what you, what you get out, what you put into it. Um, it's kind of an interesting situation that I'm in. I still feel very young. 
Um, and I can't, I can't really tell of all my history, but I can tell you, but I feel like I can inspire with my story and let kids know that you can be successful, you can make a great living, you can have great tools, nice truck, nice house, uh, if you work hard and uh, continue to uh, do your best. I just want to say thank you guys very much for having me today, and I'll uh, do some questions. Uh, I just close by saying something that I tell a lot of homeowners that I've met over the years, and even my own clients, that I've seen them act inappropriately to my workmen, my, my staff. And I always was disappointed when a, home, <coughs> excuse me, a homeowner would go to someone of, of my staff who really wasn't controlling the job and, and sort of pester them about something which they really had no business doing and that they should have been talking to me. But respect is one of the real things that we have to get back into place as well. Um, the trades are not respected well enough. Um, as Mike Rowe says, <laughs> these are the people that make our lives comfortable. And it's true. And I always tell homeowners, you know, if, the, if you get there and you appreciate what the craftsman is doing in your home, he's going to work, he or she will be working even harder to do a really good job for you. Um, I, I had one customer one year who said, uh, no, one of my guys was working and she started, he was like over his shoulder watching him work. He said, oh, by the way, we have three wage, uh, three wage rates. One is the best is when you're not here. Two is it's a little bit higher if you're watching us. And the highest rate is when you try to help work with, with us. <laughs> and I thought that was pretty funny that he was sharp enough to come up with that right off the bat. Um, now, we, had, we were allowed, there were no real question and answer periods during this, uh, and I guess we are allowed to have 15 minutes that we would take questions and answers, either one of us, is that correct? Hi. So both of you mentioned that kind of a commonality when you were growing up, you kind of built that uh, respect and passion for hands-on woodworking, especially from uh, kind of that father-son relationship, uh, as did I. So do you have any tips for, uh, let's say, the next generation that's coming up that has that, that, that like parent-child relationship for building that stuff with hands-on was replaced by, let's say, a video game console? Say the last part one more time. Yeah. It, that's been re that parent relationship has been replaced by a video game console. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, that's another issue is that we do have to replace the console at some point in time. I think, well, that's a, that's a thing we could have talked about is the, the, the adult parent-child uh, relationship. Um, it's, I think it's, it's hard for young people who see something that they like to do, that they would like to do, to tell their parents that it's something they want to pursue when they know that the parent is going to come back and say, why would you want to do that job? And we really have to stop doing that. And I don't know if that's what you were talking about. But basically, it's like, I ran into this guy. Um, it was at a, an event with my wife. And this woman came in, and she said, my son is a contractor now because of this old house. And I said, how old is he? And what does he do? I need his name, because we're trying to get do this generation next thing rolling. She said, he gave me his information. And she left, and then she came back, and she said, oh, yeah, so I told him one day that I wanted a door off the kitchen, a sliding door. And his father couldn't really do anything, and he said, I can do it, and he did it. And I said to her, good for you for allowing your, your son to pursue um, the career he really wants to have. I mean, we are hearing, seeing more and more people coming out of college in debt, not getting a job, and really, they, they, they just know what to do. There's plenty to do. That's very satisfactory. That's very sat satisfactory in the um, in the long run. So I don't know if that answers your question, but basically, it's 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 parents have to get into this as well. Just to cap, not to cut you off, just to cap off, uh, exposure and honesty. You know, if you have a child who wants to join the trades, give them the options. You know, if, if you're a carpenter, let them know they can do whatever they want, but educate them along the way. They could be self-employed, they could be union, they can go to trade school, they can go right into the trades. Little hand-holding, but honest, you know, 
this is the path you want to take. It, there's slow times, there's hot times, but you just got to be willing to uh, get through those. Sorry about that. Yeah, we. Right, right. Well, we, we did a, a little bit of a thing before we came here with the festival group, and uh, we had at least four or five shop related uh, people running shops and woodworking that say that they're training people, and there's several that were high school, now training in a high school. So if we can get that back into the system, I mean, I grew up in the time when, you know, Every school had shop and uh, e economics and cooking and all of that, you know, and it all went away. Um, I, I, I went to a school that didn't have it, but I had a carpenter for a father. Over here. Yeah, John and I here are running a technic training center for high school kids, and they actually come to us, and we train them with the tools and the shop that we have because their schools just aren't doing what we see needs to be done to train the next generation for manufacturing. And we're doing it in woods, but we feel that they can expand to whatever they want, whether they want to be a technician or get into metals or plastics, whatever. We're giving them the basics, how to do it safely. And I just want a carrot to dangle in front of them to, if they can get further education from us, as how do you get in contact with the organization you and Mike Rohr are with to let them see that a possibility for scholarships to go to another tech school. We're kind of getting a jump on the tech school scene, being we're training them a little bit higher in the high school age, but just what's beyond there for them for, you know, possibly um, scholarships. Yeah. I think Mike has on his website uh, the ability and the information of how you approach them for scholarships and how people, students can apply for those scholarships. Uh, and if you don't, if it isn't a, I'm sure he, you could get someone in his organization who could explain that to you. Um, <clears throat> first, I'd like to say thank you. I learned everything I know about woodworking from you. And, and I make a living. Um, question, have you interface with maker spaces much in, in this endeavor? Uh, I'm not that familiar with that. I know about it. Um, I think some some of our staff has made some, some of the TV staff has uh, made some, in, you know, tried to get involved with it in some way. But uh, that's something that that's, uh, would be good as well. You know, that might replace some of the situation where there's nothing in the schools if you have these maker places and you can start to get younger people in there, you know, men and women, boys and girls. I mean, I've seen more women starting to get into the construction industry, which is also good. Hello. Um, I'm actually uh, from Massachusetts, watched you growing up, and I went to a trade school. I'm a product of that third generation carpenter, and now I live in California, where it's totally different. And so growing up, we had the guys like yourself who built the whole house, and the quality was there, and you built a product for generations. The house was going to go to the children's children's children. How do you feel about nowadays houses being thrown up you know, in three months, just cookie cutter, and the quality is not there. How do you feel about that? Well, I guess <laughs> I'm so picky. <laughs> I, I don't even think about doing anything that would be not the best possible way to do it. That's the way I was brought up. It is sad if you've got people who are in the construction industry and who are not doing good work. I mean, cause some of the burden should go to the building inspectors who should be a little more, you know, into, the, into it, but in, the fact of the matter is is that building inspectors really are more about the overall structure and systems, but they don't really, they don't judge quality necessarily. They, they, they just interpret the code. Um, so if the code's right, it doesn't necessarily mean you have a premium house. It's, it's how it's done. And for me, it's always been about the details. Do it right, I mean, we kind of have a saying, you know, either do it right or don't do it at all. Um, I don't know how we fix that, you know, especially when you got a hot economy and there's not, and we're in this situation with no, without enough skilled craftspeople. If you don't have the people who have the ability to do the job the best possible way, you're going to have that, and I don't, I don't know how you solve that problem, unfortunately. Anybody over here? Yes. 
kind of along those same lines, do you see it as a hindrance or an opportunity as the industry progresses in innovative technologies and things of that nature where you have a machine that can do the entire job from start to finish and does that take the actual worker out of the equation? And maybe the video gamer is the guy to do that job now, I don't know. Well, you're true. it is true that the technology, uh, for somebody like me, the, that sort of technology that's beyond what I understand, uh, certainly I'm at a deficit for that. But on the other side of it, I think we're a long way from uh, technology dominating building in the sense that it's going to get all done by machinery. I don't, I don't see that happening. In, at least in, not in my lifetime, anyway. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's, it's going to be part of the picture, let's put it that way. I think you'll see more and more, you know, prefabricated pre homes off-site brought in and assembled, but I think you can never replace the swinging of a hammer on a job site and look forward the maintenance of those homes. They're not going to be able to bring that kind of technology into everyone's home. They might be able to put a computer on the wall that can monitor it, but some things need to be fixed by hand. So there's quite a bit of job security in the trades, I think. All right, we're back over here now. Awesome. Hey, thanks, guys. I'm sure you want to work with people who want to be there, obviously, but you're probably also working with people who maybe this is their first time, but uh, what are some of the important lessons for coaching and mentoring and also uh, really just helping with the, the focus and, and what are some of the key lessons that you try and share with the, in terms of just building the quality that these young people will bring? Yeah. Well, it goes back to what I was talking about earlier, which is was respect. And when I had got people working for me, I remember, you know, you'd, I'd give them a task, and I'd say, you know, I want you to frame that wall, and I want you to do this, that, and the other thing. And then I kind of created a rule of my own, which was, if you don't understand what I'm telling you, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Ask me the question before you make the mistake, because you're costing me money, and you're slowing the job down. So that's kind of what I, I tried to do. And it, I don't didn't want to do it in an offensive way. I just want to say, look, don't be afraid to ask the questions. And I think it's, it's bad because you get some of these young people and they want to get into the trade, but they kind of feel they're not mature enough yet to understand that it's better to figure out exactly what you should be doing than rather taking a guess at it and then making a mess out of it. And then you feel really bad about it. So I think that's part of what you have to do if you're in the business, no matter what trade you are. Just say to you guys, look, or, or women, just say, you know, this is one of my rules. If you don't understand what I'm saying, I'd be happy to, you know, to do it for you. I used to, we used to take pencils and draw on two by fours, you know, that an exact sketch of what we wanted done, and then they felt comfortable. So, if you already had uh, a worker with you who's going along, I would say diversify. You know, watch the other trades, pick up what you can from them. If it's someone that just you know, it's a, a nephew or something like that who wants to join the trades, but he doesn't know what he wants to do. I would say get a job as a laborer for a summer and just watch all the trades. Don't You don't go invest a th you know, thousands of dollars in carpentry tools. And you might not like it. You might want to be an electrician or a plumber. So sweep up and talk to the subs and see what they like, and, you know, you can make your choice from there. Now, in, fact, in fact, with our apprentices on the job now, that's exactly what a lot of them are doing. They, you know, they're trying to figure out if it's, this really is their path that they should be on. We had one young woman who worked for us down on the Jamestown project, and um, she was she was really quite uh, merry. Yeah, she was, and so right now she finished up with this old house, and then she's up in Maine now, I think it is, yeah. taking a timber framing building course. Mm -hmm. So she's into it, and it's great. Nathan, like you, I came up to the military. How was your experience with the CBs as far as working on things? Did they give you the opportunity to basically work on, well, they never give you just one thing. They say, okay, we're starting here yeah. and we're ending there. Um, how was that experience and do you see it still continuing? Uh, the CBs are still going very, very strong. Um, they're on a, they're kind of scoping down a little bit after the wars, Iraq and Afghanistan. They're kind of tapering back a little bit. They're getting rid of a few battalions. Um, but my time in, the, one of my favorite things about the CBs is there's eight different rates to choose from. But when you join a small detachment, you go to small places like Timor or uh, the Horn of Africa or wherever you go, all of a sudden you're doing everyone else's rates too. So if the plumbers need help, today you're laying pipe or the electricians are putting a box in, maybe you're running a line. And someone's going to be uh, in charge of it. They're going to help you and 
talk to you along the way, but all of a sudden you hop out of the, uh, the Connex box you're just wiring and you hop into a truck or a skid steer and you're, you're moving materials. So that was a great way to diversify, uh, but the CBs are still doing very good and I really enjoyed my experience. Over here. <laughs> Oh, I guess I could stand up, but that isn't going to make much of a difference. Um, anyway, right now there are rules um, government-wise that these uh, young adults can't even walk onto the to uh, shadow or uh, internship till they're 18. Is uh, Mike Rose organization or yours working on where we can get these students in uh, to shadow or or internship? Um, on construction sites sooner. You know, keep them on the ground <laughs> yeah. because you, myself, all grew up around these tools. We were using them before we could, you know, walk straight. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You know, it's, uh, that's a tough one, I think, to change. Um, and I think it, that would be less of a problem if, if schools, you know, if these younger people are in like a uh, elementary school or, or, you know, high school, and if they had the shops and the, ex the exposure or the opportunity in those venues, it might be a lot easier to try to do that than to try to do it in the field because there are a lot, it's a lot of insurance issues with that. Um, it, it's, it's tough. Yeah. Hmm. All right. We got time for one last question right over here. Good afternoon. My question is how um, uh, how would you best uh, approach hiring veterans uh, in in the industry? Because uh, that's certainly you know they're certainly qualified from doing what they've done in, in service and you know what's the best way to go about um, attracting and hiring veterans it's kind of a tough question because a lot of different organizations handle it differently um, if you really want to get involved uh, check out your local VA center they should have a rep of guys who are getting out of the military who might have some experience in the trades who are looking for job opportunities um, I might screw it up I think it's called chapter 36 um, is a new program that they're running for veterans who are transitioning out and they set you up with a counselor at a VA and they pretty much set up uh, your schedule for you. You know, do I want to go right to work? Do I want to go in the union or do I want to go to college? And they help prep an avenue for you to approach. Um, but I do have some great VA contacts. I can talk to you on the side, give you their emails. All right. Well, Nathan, uh, we learned plenty here today. Thank you for your service to our country. I appreciate it. Norm, thank you for what you mean to our industry as a whole. I mean, as you heard here today firsthand, you shared with me earlier, you know, you hear that often and what that means. And so uh, having a public face out there and taking a stance for our industry means a lot as far as an awareness standpoint. So with this, again, we thank Festool for uh, bringing this duo here and making this happen. And this concludes our web talk. And so we hope that in the show cycle two years from now that you'll come back and join us again next year, or next show cycle, excuse me. But uh, go out and enjoy the rest of the show and hope you enjoy AWFS 2019. Thank you.